I want to wrap up with the Paloma studies. And Alex, I'll go to you here. You mentioned the ease of administration of therapy. We know that cycle one, day one could sometimes be a long you know, infusion. Uh, you bring them back cycle one, day two. Uh, and each infusion does get better as we sort of monitor patients less. How does the cocoon regimen, the subcutaneous formulation, change the administration of this therapy, both for the clinician and the patient? And, you know, talk to me a little bit about the, the Paloma 3 data. So the Paloma 3 data was a very was straightforward clinical study, and it randomized people to either get sub -P or IV, mainly a PK study. But it showed very simply it was, you know, the infusion reactions didn't go to nil, but it's pretty darn close. And bottom line is it's a much less likelihood of instance of infusion related reactions. It's also much less time in the clinic. So your time in the clinic, and that's very important because at the end of the day, you know, it's quality of life about patients that are arriving in, coming in, sitting there. Nobody likes to be, I shouldn't say nobody, but most people don't like to be in the college office. So as soon as they can get in, as soon as they can get out, everybody's happier. And I'm sure like you, our offices are tight for space as well. But most importantly, it's getting those patients out, getting back from normal life. The subcutaneous administration really makes it a lot easier. So literary extrapolation, there was actually a little bit of a hint and improved efficacy. It really wasn't designed for that, but the curves did separate in terms of real world survival. Whether or not that's truly real, and we obviously hope it is, and what the mechanism of action is a lot of hand waving is a little bit unknown, but that's an added benefit as well, because that was also looked at. So at the end of the day, once we get the approval in the United States of sub Q, I think it's going to be a deal changer for anybody getting amabantamet with a first line, second line, next line, 20 but it'll make our patients' lives a lot easier, make our nurses' lives a lot easier, and make our lives a lot easier as well because we're not running for these IRRs. Yeah. Bria and Eric, you mentioned that you're an investigator on the Copernicus study. What's your experience been with subcutaneous? We know on that trial it's Q4 weeks, um, and again, not yet FDA approved at this time, but hopefully in the near future. What's your experience been? Well, up exactly what you know, Alice has said. Honestly, the time toxicity component is really meaningful. Having them come out every four weeks is also a game changer as well too, right? That's very manageable, right? As compared to going every two weeks or having to come in more often and mitigate those infusion related reactions. So the experience is very positive. Yeah, I agree. I'm also on that study and your patients are much happier to get the sub-Q ejection. It's five minutes. Yeah. Uh, and the monitoring time is significantly lower. We mentioned the infusion related reaction is, you know, 10% compared to 67% or so uh, historically. Danny, your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. I, I, I definitely appreciate that it's um, more convenient for patients and for the staff. Uh, I do just caution that um, the EGFR and med-related side effects, the, the dermatological adverse events, the, uh, the hypoalkinemia, the edema is still there. So even though patients may not need to be in the clinic for as long, they still need uh, proper follow-up uh, to help manage these adverse events. Yeah, it's an excellent point. The rates of EGFR med talks or adverse events not really change with the subcutaneous formulation. And I think on that study, on the Copernicus trial, we're using cocoon, so cutaneous prophylaxis. You know, we're doing, you know, sort of the BTE prophylaxis. So it'd be interesting to see what that survival data looks like. And, you know, in my experience, the patients have been tolerating it much better uh, than the IV formulation. But I think we have to use what we have available to patients in the clinic. So excellent discussion, really an exciting time for EGFR mutation, positive patients. We have, you know, two new FDA approved regimens with survival data. You know, how common do you see that in a space where two studies show significant survival data? We spent a lot of time today focusing on hemivantamab and lizardinib, where median overall survival has not yet been reached. Uh, in my opinion, amivantamab is a differentiated asset, right? It's an EGFR met by specific. You've seen time and time again that it has phenomenal CNS activity and the intracranial progression-free survival that you mentioned double uh, for amilaz over osimertinib alone. Uh, we know we also see benefit in the high-risk subgroups, but it's at the cost of some adverse events that we've talked about. So learning how to mitigate those adverse events learning how to, you know, manage and sort of educate patients, BTE prophylaxis, you know, you said dexamethasone to reduce the rate of IRR infusion reaction are very helpful and, and allow patients to be on therapy longer uh, to benefit from uh, treatment. Any closing remarks from, from anyone in the group? Uh, maybe your experience, Danny, uh, to close out? Uh, yeah, I, I, I echo Dr. Subari's uh, sentiment. It's definitely exciting time for ease on EGFR. Uh, patients, we have, uh, you know, two combination therapies that are allowing them to live a lot longer. 
Uh, but a lot, of, uh, a lot of the research is going to making their quality of life better as well. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate them um, and, and fortunate to be in this space right now. It's an exciting time and more to come uh, for, uh, for these patients for hours of the week. Yeah, I mean, this historical perspective, I always come to these things and now somehow the older one. You know, I remember, and Betty probably does too, the time when we didn't have each of our neurons, right? You know, we had first generation, which had a lot of reaction side effects. And then Osimertinin came by. I, and they were first being given, we didn't even know what an HFR mutation was, right? It was a small subset of patients that really worked. And we figured that out. And then just this draw up this perspective. And it's what oncology should be, right? You get to the point, you make better drugs, you mitigate the toxicity, and you never stop, right? Because, you know, what used to be a horrible disease, only treated with chemotherapy, then gets treated with a pill but still only has a three or four years to survive. And we got to keep pushing that up with either new and better therapies or therapies to mitigate the side effects. Yeah. Completely agree. We, we can't be satisfied with where we are. I mean, we have patients in the office, families. We really need to move the field forward. And I love to have 18 years old at all, 18 years survival to all my patients. But, you know, if you're 45 or 50 years old, and a lot of these patients are, five years is, right? You're not good enough. Three. Yeah, I'm so grateful to be able to have different treatment options for patients that are newly diagnosed, even beyond the newly diagnosed, right? Or even adding the sequencing conversation, all the nuances of what to cool for the right patient and sitting in front of us in clinic. Um, I think this is really an opportunity for education. I truly believe in it, not just for the providers and our colleagues, but for patients so we can have really effective, informed, and shared decision-making. Both need to have. Great points. And Eddie, you get the last word as always. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, my, 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 my last word would be for the patient that is listening to us, as well as our colleague, the, those primary care physicians, that you are the first uh, line to, to identify a patient with EGFR mutation. So if you find a patient with EGFR mutation, please refer the patient to a medical oncologist and please also uh, refer patients to clinical trial. I want to say on behalf of all of us that we are investigators for a Copernicus, thank you for your trust. Thank you for being part of this and please refer patients so we can complete this Copernicus trial, which I think is very important, in which we had the same efficacy from Mariposa, but putting everything together that what we have learned. And I hope that uh, the FDA in the future can approve uh, this uh, sub-Q uh, Amibanta because I think it's going to be uh, a change in the game for the patients and the family, very well described by, by Dr. Espira, that uh, it will help all of us significantly. So again, thank you to our patients are listening, you know, for participating in clinical trials. At a great point, you know, clinical trials is the future, are the future. It allows us to change treatments and improve outcomes for patients. I want to thank everyone for listening, for your attention. Also want to thank my colleagues and really the, the future is bright and it's an exciting time for patients with EGFR mutation positive non-small cell lung cancer. Thank you.